That's my sign. How's everybody doing this afternoon? Come on, you guys look like you just came out of the coal mine. We're software engineers. We have like one of the most luxurious jobs in the world. Most of us actually find our job fun. And there's not a lot of people that can say that in this world. There's a whole lot of people that have to do a whole lot of things that they'd rather not do to earn money. And the only thing that dogs me at work is going to meetings. So I'm doing pretty good. OK, so the talk. Uh, let us go ahead and start going. Be, uh, the original name of the talk was isomorphic uh, Kotlin. And then I realized in 45 minutes, I can't really do two sides of an application really in depth. So I'm going to concentrate on the server, because I think the Android side's probably more well covered. Um, and this is almost a part two of the talk Marco just gave for anybody that was here for the previous talk. It's kind of a, the same thing, only different. So who the heck am I? Um, whoa, see, the, it, things go too fast. Whoa. Um, my name is Troy Miles. Uh, my Twitter handle is The Rock Encoder. I have been doing this for a crap load long time, like going close to 40 years now I've been writing code. Um, so I sold my first game in 1979, written in 6502 Assembler. If anybody knows who, what that is, see me later. We'll have drinks. <laughs> um, I, I work for a, a uh, Southern California-based automotive valuations, sometimes known as Kelly Blue Book. Um, and uh, that is my actual email address down at the bottom. I also did a, a video for lynda.com on Kotlin, learning Kotlin from the eyes of a Java programmer. Um, and I'm kind of an every programmer. As my wife could testify, I seem to spend almost all of my time writing code of various flavors. So I don't know too much about what's going on on TV. I don't know what the new hip group everybody's listening to is. Occasionally, I know what's going on at the movie theaters. And I know when playoff season is for most major sports, and that's about it. Um, the code that I'm going to show you today is going to be here at uh, GitHub at Rock Encoder slash RK1 for Rat Pack Kotlin 1. Um, that's for all the source code as it is right now. So if you go there and you download it, you know, you'll see what I see. So a lot of the data that I'm going to show you today is coming from fueleconomy.gov. I'd love to show you more stuff like uh, the data that we use at Kelly Blue Book, but unfortunately, it's proprietary. <laughs> And I, that's how I make my money, so I'm not giving away the family jewels. Um, but fueleconomy.gov, they are the official source of government fuel economy. So not only does Kelly Blue Book use it, pretty much all the different automotive websites that show you MPG um, are using that source of data. Um, <clears throat> unfortunately, it's government data, and their, their, their data is not that clean. Um, at least the way that I would like to think of clean data. I'm not a data person. I just use it. But um, it's got it's free vehicle information, and I mean like multiple megabytes of it. Um, and it's like going all the way back to like 1980 or something like that of, of different vehicles. Not every single vehicle is on there, but most of them are. Um, they also have a web service, to be honest. Uh, I don't usually use their web service that much. Um, but you can download their data as either a CSV or XML. You know, you could do it XML if you're really feeling torturous. And it, it, it kind of looks like this. And this goes on for like, you know, 50 or 60,000 rows of this. And part of the problem with this stuff is I need to change it into something usable. So today what I'm going to show you is an application that uses Kotlin. It uses MongoDB. We're going to deploy it to Heroku, and I'll talk about why that was my choice. Just think, he's cheap. Yes, that's part of it. Um, <clears throat> so in order to change this into usable data, here's my command line down at the bottom. <laughs> um, part of the problem with the data is just that um, things like, for instance, um, the Mongo importer, when it imports data, it looks at it and says, oh, this is a number. I'm going to make this. It doesn't have a decimal point, so I'm going to make it an integer. 
Can anybody see a problem with that? Um, Mazda 626, Mazda 323. So the model is a number, and so it changes it into an integer. Now, because it's Mongo, and pretty much everything goes in MongoDB, it's OK for you to have a field that sometimes is a string and sometimes is an integer. It's not a good idea. Some of your code may choke on it, but Mongo says, well, you're the programmer. I'm going to let you do whatever you want. You obviously, you've got that degree or something that says that you know what you're doing, so cool. Um, but in order to try to clean it up a little bit, you can do things like put constraints on it so that you say, hey, no, this field right here, it is a string, it is a number. Um, some of the data you're going to see, I do things like, oh, the field says Y or N, yes or no. Human being can figure that out pretty easy. But guess what? <laughs> Your Boolean converter can't. T or F, it may be able to figure out true or false, it may be able to figure out 0 or 1. But Y and N, I ain't got no clue. So I just said, I don't really use this field for this data anyways. So we'll just make it a string. Um, and so either way, what we end up with something is that looks like this. And luckily, because we're in Kotlin, we can easily change this into a data class like this. And this is kind of the data that we're going to be working with as I do some examples of, of what's going on here. And the other thing is just kind of keep in mind that I'm using the free tier of everything that I'm showing you. So we may be a little performance challenged, also depending on what's going on with the gods of the internet. Um, things may be a, a bit challenged. However, in actual production, when you're using a paid instance of Mongo, and the service I'm going to use is MLab, they give you like 500 uh, megabytes of free data, which is more than enough for like all of my little experiments. But when you use an actual production instance, you have like, you know, it's much faster, it's much more efficient, you have backups, replication, all kinds of other things that you would need to be in production. <clears throat> um, so let me, let me, we've known each other all of, I don't know, seven minutes now. So I think we're in a place of trust. And I'm going to tell you about my dream. So I work at Kelly Blue Book. It's written in ASP.NET. Um, eventually it was updated to MVC. And I don't care whatever comes next on that, that line, I hate gigantic programs. That is, I don't care if, it was, if we rewrote the whole thing in spring, MVC, it's still a big, gigantic thing. And the problem with big, gigantic things is it's very difficult for teams of developers, no matter how skilled they are, to move fastly when they're all chained together at the ankle. So my team. We work on a little part of the thing called Instant Cash Offer. Um, we're the first of the ones to break away from the monolith now. Um, our front end is static. Our back end is uh, just a, ooh, a microservice. Right now, it's still running off of kbb.com, but eventually, we're going to put it on either Lambda or something like that, because um, I don't know, last year sometime, we had this engineering tour of different uh, cloud services, and they were, we were told that everyone's opinion was important, and we were asked to evaluate different ones. And while we were still in the middle of evaluating, we said, oh, AWS One, thank you for your input. <laughs> if you think that's not what it's like working at a big company, that's what it is. Kelly Blue Book itself is actually still kind of small, because we're like 500 people, but we're owned by Cox Automotive, which is I don't know, $16 billion company. So our little piddly money that we make, our three, $400 million doesn't mean anything to them. Um, so a microservice is a service with one and only one narrowly focused capability that uh, a remote API exposes to the rest of the system. My dream is to bust up Kelly Blue Book into just a series of microservices and static front ends. And the idea being that each team could be responsible, could deploy their own stuff whenever they want, whenever they feel the need. They could watch it in production. We don't have to be all chained together. And you can write it in whatever language your team is more comfortable working in. Because if your service is just a bunch of endpoints, an API, does it matter if it's written in Kotlin and C Sharp and Go or whatever? If your team can support that and you guys are OK with that, why not? Why do we have to write the whole thing in the same language? <clears throat> it's, 
it's a dream. It's going to take a long time. Like I said, my team is the first one that actually have busted a piece off, and we're still trying to figure out all the little mechanics of how that's going to work out. But let's talk some more about this. So the idea of a, of a microservice is just that. Now, in, back in my day, God, I feel so weird saying that. I feel like my grandfather, except without the charm, because he was very charming, and I'm just kind of plodding along. Hey, don't laugh. I was told in my evaluation that I'm very intimidating, simply because when people say things, I ask them, did you really mean to say that, or something like that. So uh, a microservice is going to run in its own process, owns its own data store, can be deployed on its own, can be written in different languages. And the idea being that you want a team of you know, a few developers to be able to support multiple microservices. Not just one, but several. You know, and ideally, somehow they're related or something like that. And that you know, our dream is to eventually be able to, you know, like right now we have some of our monitoring stuff up, but eventually we want to get to the point that we're actually monitoring our own stuff. There's no DevOps involved. Now, trust me, this isn't DevOps's dream. <laughs> this is engineering's dream. And their dream is completely different. Although nobody seems to care what it is, but <laughs> at least nobody on engineering. So what do all these Java frameworks have, have, to, uh, have in common? Now, back in, in my days, what was it, Java server pages that used to give me the nightmares? Um, yeah, there's a couple of people nodding their head. You, you know what it was like. You survived. Do you still have the scars? Are you still going to counseling? <laughs> um, but, and, I'm, and mind you, please don't get me wrong, I'm not trying to bust anyone's chops. I'm not sitting here saying that this is good, this is bad. But what I'm saying is for my needs, it's too big. These are all really big uh, frameworks. And if you're somebody sitting on the front end, whether it's Android or iOS or JavaScript client, you've already got enough stuff to worry about. What you don't want to have to worry about is go, you just need a simple back end, maybe a place to store some data, maybe a place to get some new data. And you don't want to have to wait on a back end team. And I, I, I hate these labels, by the way, because to me, I'm just a programmer. If it has a CPU, I can code it. Give me a CPU and some sort of a toolkit, and I don't care what it is, because I've coded everything from video games to avionics systems to uh, microcontroller-based things. And it's still just code. Once you've learned that first language, once you've gotten over that first hurdle of getting Hello World to pop up, you should now be able to move on to just about anything else that you want to do. <clears throat> so Java, luckily, is kind of going through kind of a renaissance over the last five or six years where there's a lot more stuff coming out on the JVM. And there are two frameworks in, in particular that I really like. And the reason why I like them is because they strip things down to their bare essence. Um, they're not trying to be everything to everyone. Most of these MVC frameworks, the problem with them is, isn't that the people that wrote them aren't smart? Isn't that they're, they're, they're not competitive or not keeping up? It's that they're trying to solve too many people's problems. And they can't abandon anybody. So one of these frameworks is called Spark. And I'll be honest. I came to Spark kind of late. If I had seen Spark when I first pitched the idea for this talk, things might have been different. Um, and I also admit that there are times where I just like names that are cool. <laughs> and if I have to choose between Spark and Rat Pack and being a fan of, of Dean <laughs> Frank Sinatra, Dean Martin, and the rest of the Rat Pack, of course I'm going with Rat Pack. I had a big, long argument one time with my wife. Actually, we argue all the time, but it's more fun arguments. And she's always surprised at the weird stuff that I like that just seems like a non sequitur. And one of those things is I really do like Frank Sinatra and Dean Martin movies. And I know most of the songs. And when she hears me singing them, she's like, you've got to be kidding me. How do you even know this? And I'm just like, I've been around. I've seen things. So Spark, <clears throat> and I say AKA Spark Java because there's another framework platform out there that has something to do with really big data or something called Spark. I don't know very much about it, and it's a source of confusion. Um, is a micro framework for creating web applications in Kotlin and Java 8 with minimum effort. So one of the things that I like about all of these frameworks, 
both of these frameworks is that they let the web be the web. I'm not trying to mask everything up and protect you from the code. I had a bug in some ASP.NET MVC code that I nearly got on a plane and went to Redmond over. I set something to an error, a 400 error, because if you send me bad data from the client, that's the proper response is a 400, that it's a client error. And I also put a message in the body to help figure out what the problem was. <clears throat> now, Microsoft, in their infinite wisdom, and their billions of dollars, decided that on, on my local machine, it's OK to put that message body in there. But when we pushed it to a server, not to. So I genuinely had a case of it works on my machine and it didn't work on our, on our test servers. And so QA said, hey, this isn't working. And I you know, tried it out on my own machine, and it worked. And I thought, OK, she usually is right about these things, so I need to take a deeper look. And I did. And you know, I noticed that on the test server, sure enough, it was broken. And then I couldn't figure out why for about four hours until finally I got deep into a stack overflow thing, and they explained it. So either way, uh, Spark came out in, in 2013. It's just a lightweight framework. It has a lot of docs and a lot of tutorials, and they're heavily pushing the Kotlin side of this thing. Now, I didn't know this until about a month ago. And somebody was pointing it out to me that, oh, have you tried Spark? And I go, why would I want to mess around with big data? Uh, <clears throat> and they're going, no, 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 it's a framework. It's, like, it's kind of like what you're describing Rat Pack as. And I'm like, uh-oh. Um, Rat Pack is the other one, and now Rat Pack supports Groovy, Java, and Kotlin. It was released in 2012, so it's about a year older. Um, their, their latest release was 1.5, which is in September. It has a lot of docs, but not a lot of examples. And the one thing that I'm going to say, if I was starting new, I would probably pick Spark over uh, Rat Pack right now, is that Rat Pack doesn't have a lot of docs that are not in Groovy. Now, I know Groovy, so that made it easy for me. So I could look at it and go, OK, this is, and not to mention, autocomplete helps a lot of problems. God, I, I'm so addicted to that. I don't, I don't know how I ever coded before. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> all of these are going to be about a, a RESTful API. And the idea is just that we're going to let HTTP be HTTP. We're going to operate on the methods on there, I, I think. Is, it, is there anyone here who doesn't know what a RESTful API is at this point? If you, if you don't, it's OK. Raise your hand, and I'll, I'll make sure I talk about these slides. Nope, everybody's look, giving me that look like, come on, dude. <laughs> All right, so we can kind of walk past these really quick. These are just the HTTP methods. Um, and I've got this two ways. So first, I'm just going to show the code and show what's going on here. The, the app that I'm going to show you doesn't really have a lot of things in it. Of course, I have Rat Pack. Um, I have the Java and Kotlin plugins in here. Um, and I also bring in <clears throat> the uh, Java drivers for MongoDB. Um, there's this thing that I use called KMongo. And what KMongo does is it lets me play around with Mongo easier in Kotlin. So it is a tool that lets me like say, hey, this is a vehicle class. Give me back a list of these. And it takes care of the, the hard work. Oh, you know, I just realized that that's my finger doing that. Sorry. <laughs> OK, so KMongo. And the other thing is just that, um, well, I need to know what the main class name is for, for this app. So that's getting put out as well. Um, in my file, one of the things that I found, and I don't know if you guys have heard about this, but there's a lot of nefarious characters out there in the internet people who would like to do bad things with your data or your servers. So one of the things that I never, ever do is put a, con a connection string to anything in source code. It's always in an environmental variable. It's locked on a server. Um, luckily, I can do this both on my local machine and I can do this on Heroku as well um, because I've seen people who have published out their connection strings accidentally to GitHub. And then they go, oh, but I, it's OK. I, I, I deleted that. You know, I, I quickly deleted it and then pushed it out. 
And I said, you, you don't know how Git works, do you? <laughs> and it's like, but it was so quick. Nobody could ever find it. I go, you don't know how, how the computers work, do you? People don't scan for this stuff themselves. They write scripts that scan for this stuff. And as soon as it happens, they've, they've grabbed your info. There's, those darn software engineers are pretty smart. Um, <clears throat> so either way, the things that are important here is that by default, uh, Rat Pack likes to use uh, port 5050 when it's running on your local host. I just have page count set for 20 so that I, I limit myself to 20 items. This sort YMM, this is just a, a really quick uh, sort, and I don't want to have to keep writing it all over the place, where it just says I want the year um, descending, the make ascending, the model ascending. Um, and then I've, uh, I've got an environmental variable called MongoDB connection, and this is my MongoDB connection string to MLAB. So I'm pushing all my data up to MLAB. Just in general, I don't like to run databases on my own box. I, I know some, a lot of people do, and I, and I could see the appeal of it, but I just hate the idea of something sucking up memory and doing a task constantly. You know, I know Mongo, you start it, but either way, it sucks up memory. <clears throat> um, my database itself, here's the connection, it's super simple. There's not a lot going on here. I'm not trying to get really fancy. I just want something that works. And so I finally have a reason for a singleton. Since there can only, only I, I've got one database and one connection to it, here's a need for a singleton. And in this case, the only thing that it's doing is it's pulling in from my environmental variable the connection to get uh, to connect to it is creating a Mongo URI, then it creates the client. And then it does a git database, and it fills uh, that variable database with it. Um, I probably should do something to handle the exception. Now, quite honestly, on the web, if that exception occurs, there really ain't a whole lot you can do, except maybe pause for five seconds or 10 seconds and try it again. And either way, that kind of code gets too complicated for a 45-minute demo. The function down at the bottom is just going to get my collection of vehicles. Now, keep in mind that this call right here does not transfer data. It is just sort of a theoretical connection. Until I issue an actual query, Mongo's not doing anything. <clears throat> um, here's a really quick, dirty, stupid, um, pointless, but I'm still going to show it to you, hello type world app for Mongo running on the server, running on your server. And all it's going to do is if you hit the, the local host, it's going to say, hey, hello world. If you hit it with the, at, from the local with a slash and then a name, it's going to print back, hey, hello, whatever your name is. Um, in fact, let's, let's see if we can get this running real quick. Let's... There's a point where I just hate slides. I used to have a guy that did my slides for me, and then he went to college, and then he didn't give a crap anymore about his father. <laughs> yeah, apparently in school these days, and starting in junior high, they teach them office products so that they can do demonstrations. Whoa, whoa. What's going on here? Oh, ports are... Oh, God. This is going to be the, this is the new bane of my existence, port in use. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't think that I was, though, so that's the fun part. This is how often I have to do this, that I, I it's still in my... Sorry, I'm just killing the process that's running. And let's try that again. OK, so, <clears throat> and I always just kind of, the, the part of the reason that I don't like these sort of examples is that it's hard to extrapolate from that point to something useful. So if we say, hey, we go to localhost 5050, we get a hello world. If I say localhost 5050 with a Troy, it's going to say hello Troy. That's all it does. And my problem with those sort of examples is that, hey, once you're there, how, how do I make routes, actual like routes that I would use? How, how do I make something that's actually useful for me? Um, so this is why I wanted to put this example in here, is that here is kind of a little bit more complicated thing. So first off, um, 
After the start, we see that we have a server um, config, <clears throat> and this is going to set the assigned port. Because 5050 works when you're on your own machine, but when you're on Heroku, Heroku assigns, and pretty much all cloud providers are going to assign a port to you. Don't assume that it's going to be 80 or 443. It's going to be some random number because they're going to have your process and a bunch of other processes all running, and they're going to be splitting up requests and directing your request to the port that they assigned you. So I need to get the assigned port from them, and luckily it's called port, and I can just get it off of the environmental variables. Um, likewise, in here, next after that, I have handlers. So handlers are just the things are, that are going to call these endpoints. And so there's a couple of different ways that we're calling these. At the very bottom, we have just a GET request. So we can say all, pretty much all of the major uh, methods, so the, the methods are GET, POST, PUT, PATCH, DELETE, OPTIONS, um, all of them except for HEAD are, are going to be just method calls here. You can just call those methods and get yourself some, um, <clears throat> a request. Now, one of the, the things about Rat Pack is that every endpoint can have only one method that handles it, so, but there's a way around that, meaning that you can't have a git and a post both handling the same path except for when you do it through methods. So here where we see it says prefix, Prefix, we're going to say prefix vehicles, we're going to say everything that starts with slash vehicles, we're going to send it to the vehicle handler so that it can take control of it and we can split those methods off if we want to. Likewise, we have one on here called path. Um, fizz, you can see this is why they don't let me name things. Um, path fizz is also going to take it and you know call anything that starts with fizz to fizz handler, anything that starts with buzz to buzz handler, users to users. Um, and so here is what the fizz handler looks like. So you notice that I have a context by method. Context is just the thing that we're, work, that we're working with. And so we have, we can say by method, and now we can chain together git, post, patch, put, options, and delete, and call a handler for each of them. In this case, I'm just calling a very, very simple rand, uh, lambda function. Um, down below, we're just uh, calling, returning from whatever, it, whatever calls it is going to go back to that, uh, the Baz, hand, you know, I called it Buzz and I called it Baz. Somewhere something went wrong. Um, down at the bottom is the method that's getting the uh, uh, environmental variable, and I'm also checking, so if I get a null at some point, meaning that I either didn't set it or don't care, um, it's just going to go use that default port number. <coughs> so here, if I say fizz, we can see that it's saying hello from fizz. If we wanted to do something a little bit more, because I can't, I can only do gets from the command line, but I can do a post from there, and I can get an error. Wait, what the heck? Method not allowed. Oh, because I started it from here. Crap. Oh, the problems of live demos. Okay, let's run that from there. Okay, so here, now we have the post. We can also do the delete. So we can get, we can pull out all those methods. And depending on the kind of data that you're working with now, normally speaking, a Kelly Blue Book can only work with read-only data. I mean, we're not updating methods. Um, most of the other data that we're taking in, because, I mean, we, you know, like public opinions, those actually go off to a different service that does like, you know, when you want to do a rating, a review of your car, like, hey, I got the Toyota Camry. It's the best four-door sedan that looks really plain that I ever bought in my entire life. I love this car. That's, that's handled by somebody else. We're not taking care of that data. <coughs> but let us continue. Okay, so the one that kind of does like closer to the meat of what I actually do at work um, is the vehicle handler. And here I just have three different get methods. One is, hey, you call get vehicles and you don't put anything on it. Standard uh, rest uh, call reaction to that is that you return all of them, but normally you don't return all of them. You return like the first page worth. Um, <clears throat> 
And then also here I have, uh, if you get an ID, if you just put in uh, a single value, I'm going to assume that it's an ID. If you give me two values like Ford slash Mustang, I'm going to assume you want to know some more information about Ford Mustangs. And so we do that call. One thing that I do that's a little weird is uh, for get vehicle by ID or make, I check to see if it's a number. If the, num if the, if the thing that you put in the endpoint, um, the parameter that you're passing, is a number, I'm assuming it's a vehicle ID for a specific vehicle. If, on the other hand, it is text, I'm going to assume that it's a make, and you want to know more about that make. So, for instance, you might be just wanting to list through Toyotas um, and not anything else. So, if we come back here and I say um, Ford slash Mustang, and I get an error. Crap, what the hell? Oh, vehicles, thank you. Yes. See, you could be my peer programmer anytime. Now the internet goes to sleep. What the heck? And while that's doing that, because that's taking way too long, it's, uh oh, it, but it did come back with data. I'm sorry, I'm actually going through my phone here because I don't trust the the other thing, but you can see we got a bunch of Ford Mustangs. Here's all the way. The first one is 2017, and the 20th one would be uh, 2014 uh, Mustang. And there's you know some information about it. There's its city mileage, its combined mileage. Somewhere in here is its highway mileage, is I guess 30 miles, 30 miles per gallon. <coughs> so. We're taking advantage of Kotlin. We're you know, doing all the nice little fancy things. We're chaining things together. We're calling lambdas. We're calling functions directly, passing them in. We're getting collections. So here you can see on like uh, get all vehicles, I get the collection, and then I do a find. And the find.sort.take, that's what causes data to actually get, be requested. And just calling, getting the collection itself doesn't do anything. Because every now and then, because different languages and different database technologies do things differently, when people see that Git collection, they're like, oh my god, are you like, getting all the vehicles? I'm like, no, 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 calm down. That's not it. Um, either way, here's the Git by make, Git by model. And all of these things, I'm doing a sort, and I do a take, and I can also do a skip. So I have some functions that you guys aren't seeing yet. And the skip and take allow me to do paging. So probably what I would do is something like, hey, every time you call me, you know, the first time I'm going to give you the first ones. And then if you call me with like the counter, something in the head, um, the, the header of this uh, request that says, hey, give me the second page. Then I'll give you the second page, the third page, fourth page, because you can just keep track of the page yourself. This is not all implemented in here, but I think there's enough to get the point. Everybody's looking at me like, hmm. I don't know, Troy. So MongoDB is just a document database. It's, it's, it's designed for the web. Now the thing is, be careful with your tools. A lot of times people will be so eager to get out of SQL land because there's three people in the world who enjoy SQL coding, and I'm not one of them. Um, and they're, they're so hot for it, and they go, well, I'm, I'm going to stop using SQL and just switch everything over to Mongo. Mongo's good for certain things. It's good for things where, for instance, you don't have a fiduciary responsibility. Like, for instance, if I was doing anything with a lot of money, especially like, say, cars or houses or something where I'm doing the transaction online and I need to keep track of it, or I need to keep records, I'm not using Mongo. I already know in SQL, it's going to keep a transaction log of everything that I do. And that transaction log actually will hold up in court about like, hey, here's when this transaction took place or didn't take place. Um, I'd be really careful uh, about switching things because if you switch to Mongo and you don't have that transaction log, I'm sure they probably have something similar now because that was one of their big people's big gripes about Mongo when it first came out. But on the other hand, if what you're doing is tracking photos of adorable kittens and you lose a kitten, who cares? <laughs> and don't, please don't call PETA on me. That's just a joke. 
Sometimes they don't fly right, and people take it the wrong way. Um, but either way, it's high performance, high availability. And the thing that I kind of want you to, except for that first call, and just kind of keep in mind that when we're doing this, I am, again, running on just uh, the low-cost, free tier of things. So we're not fully high performance. But I got like 1.47 seconds off of that. It's, it's really small, but it's right there in the upper corner. I've seen it when it, everything's primed and running fast, you know, down to like 200, 300 milliseconds. It could, on the prod stuff, I get it down to 50 or 60 milliseconds, which isn't bad. It's, it's, I, still would, I still want more because until it says one millisecond or less, you know, there's still some more to be squeezed out of it, but, you know, some more better indexing, a few other things, maybe we can get a little higher. So either way, it's a document database. And just think of a document as a JSON database. You know, they call it BSON, which is binary JSON, but it's, it's, it allows you to store a bunch of different things in it. I mean, it's the number five, the fifth most popular database engine in the world, and that's as of last month. Um, you know, Oracle, is still number one and will probably be for the rest of our lifetimes because um, Larry Ellison doesn't have more money than God for no reason. <laughs> what's the joke? Uh, what's the difference between God and Larry Ellison? God doesn't think he's Larry Ellison. <laughs> he's probably going to show up with that darn katana sword. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't register on his uh, thing. So if you're used to SQL and you're looking at Mongo, you're not like, what's the difference? What's going on here? Troy, it's really confusing. Um, just keep in mind that, hey, we've got columns, we've got fields, we've got rows, we've got, for rows, we have a document, for a table, we have a collection. Okay, I seem to have lost sound. Hello? Hello, hello? Okay, you got me now? No? Can't hear me? Can you guys hear me? No? A little? Do you want me to shout some more? Oh, okay, and the sound seems to be back. I, I don't know, because um, <clears throat> I can definitely shout. <laughs> um, either way, so that's the sort of the quick translation. Quick CRUD operations are going to be insert, find, update, and remove for uh, delete, update, read, and create. Um, some uh, query modifiers are going to be skip, take, sort. Pretty just makes the JSON look good, like, and it's really useful when you're doing stuff from the command line. For the stuff we're doing, it doesn't matter, because... We're just sending raw JSON out of there. Um, KMongo, as I said before, is just a toolkit. And, you know, just, I think I pointed it out already, but just to be sure. Oops. So the places where I'm calling, oh, actually it's here. Where I do this. And I say get collection, and I uh, you know, return this thing in here. And then from the other side, inside the vehicles module, when I get this collection, this is giving me a Mongo collection of vehicle. And I, don't have, I didn't have to do anything. I, I, I love things that make me seem smarter, and I don't have to put in that much work, because I, don't, I never do like JSON parsing. I, and there, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of fine tools to do it, but it still feels like dirty work. Um, okay, let's finish up. So um, M Labs is just is where my uh, databases are hosted at. Again, they give you 500 megabytes of free. I do not work for M Labs. Again, I work for Kelly Blue Book, um, and they they hook up to all of the major cloud providers. So the secret about Heroku, Heroku, think of Heroku as like Docker before Docker was created. Um, it's basically you don't do a lot of anything. You just push your code through to uh, Heroku, essentially using Git, um, but it runs on top of AWS. Um, and M Labs talks to AWS, to Google, to all the other cloud providers. You can put your stuff up there. Because essentially, with Mongo, because you're actually using like a URL to talk to the database anyways, you can put your database wherever you want, so long as it's accessible over the web. Um, and it's much easier to let somebody else do that dirty work. Um, and so right now, Heroku supports PHP, if you're into that kind of thing, uh, Python, Node.js, and Node is, Node is the gun which you will shoot yourself in the foot with. Think of it that way. Because there are very few people I know that go from a dev instance of Node 
to a production instance of Node and don't manage to shoot themselves in the foot because it works so well on your machine or in your dev servers, and then they forget how it works, that it's single-threaded. And so they'll put one instance of Node you know, talking to like eight instances of ASP.NET or, or Spring MVC, and they'll go, I don't understand why the node keeps locking up. Yeah. You don't know how computers work, do you? <laughs> um, Java, Scala, and Go, and it also supports Kotlin, um, and they actually even now have their tutorials in Kotlin that'll walk you through the process of doing like a Hello Heroku app on, on uh, Heroku, uh, hello, Heroku app in Kotlin, um, and walk you through the whole steps. So you know they're they're definitely you know behind Kotlin. They they're definitely in favor of it. You get a free developer account, and that developer account you can put you can spin up as many websites as you want, but they're all running in like the single instance. So this is like super great if you're the kind of person like me that doesn't know how to turn off his computer, doesn't seem to realize it has an off switch. Um, and you know, do other things for a while, and you want to spin some stuff up, or maybe you're doing some stuff on the side. And the thing that's really nice about Heroku is when you do stuff on the side, you can transfer the site to someone else once you're finished, and then they can start paying for it. Um, and either way, it has a really nice set of command line tools. And the main thing about Heroku is when you deploy, it is basically doing a git push only you're doing it to Heroku instead of to your, your normal repo. And so Heroku login and Heroku, Heroku create will basically create a, uh, a repo, a remote repository on Git that's pointing to your Heroku app. And then when you do a Git push Heroku master, that just takes your code and pushes it up there and it builds it up there. Um, and then it will start executing it. Um, and then you can do a Heroku open command to actually launch the web instance of your app. Um, <clears throat> this right here is a copy of a proc file. And what a proc file basically is, it's just a little text file that you should have at the root. Now, if you do not have a proc file, most of the time Heroku will work. It can usually figure out what your app is. Um, and, but by having it, you, you're basically making it painfully clear that, you know, hey, I want to run on the web, because you can also do like background tasks and things like that on Heroku. And uh, we've, we've already done some live demos, and I think that is it. I think we have uh, two minutes for questions, two whole minutes. Wow, nobody. You guys, were, you guys got it all? Yes, sir, in the back. I have not. So see, this is why I love coming to these things. I, and you said, what, what kind of wizard? Drop wizard? Drop wizard? Huh, no, I have not. And that's another microservices kind of framework? Wouldn't it be nice if everybody just got together and, and they created just one? It'll never happen, but wouldn't it be nice? Hold on, I want to do one shot of you guys. Say hello. Say hello. Say hello if I can remember how to work my camera. Ah. Um, anybody else? Okay, well again, the code is out there. My name is Troy Miles. I go by The Rock Encoder on Twitter. My actual email address is rockencoder at gmail.com. If you write me, I promise I will answer back. However, I will not help you with your homework, your project, or whatever else, unless, of course, there's money involved. I do this for a living. Uh, either way, you guys have a nice rest of the conference. Thank you again for showing up, and it's been fun. <laughs>